So I have been looking at uh, various planetary bodies and over here in Idaho, I have been uh, looking at an icy body about which I will be talking to you. So this may sound a very familiar view to most of you. When I think of water fountains, many thoughts cross my mind. And what I want to tell you here is that there is some amount of scientific value in some of these observations. So when you look at the fountains, the one thing that you can see is uh, how high they are. So here are two examples. But what I am going to show you is a little bit different. And it is not from this world. I'm going to talk about fountains out of this world. Here is a 500 kilometer diameter object, which is uh, spewing out a lot of material, which we know is composed of water vapor and ice particles. To give an idea about the size, this is just merely a blip as compared to Earth or our own moon. So that brings an interesting question that how this small, tiny object is spewing out material that you can actually see from space. You don't even need to land on the surface. Here is another view of this body where over here you are seeing the diameter of the object, and here are the enormous water vapor and water ice fountains. So these are gigantic geysers which we have not seen ever. We are getting this data from Cassini-Huygens mission that was sent by uh, NASA and ESA jointly to study the Saturn and its uh, numerous satellites. The satellite is currently still in orbit and is sending us information. So let me introduce you to the guy, Enceladus. It's a tiny icy ball, and it's the fifth largest satellite of Saturn. This is the brightest object in the entire solar system, and is comprised mostly of water ice. The top layer is about 40 kilometer thick, which resides on a uh, ocean below. So going back to what I was talking about, that what are these geysers and what are, uh, where are they coming from? This is the area in the southern region of uh, Enceladus from where the geysers are coming. As regards what is powering them, we still don't have very good answers except the fact that we know when Enceladus is going around Saturn, because it comes close and goes far away, the gravity of Saturn squishes this ball, and that may be providing some source of energy, which is helping uh, this tiny body to spew out these uh, giant geysers. So zooming into the South Pole, the activity is centered along these fractures. For scale, these are about 100 kilometers long, about two kilometer wide and they are separated by a distance of 35 to 50 kilometers. So these are giant fractures out of which this material is coming out. Here is another view of uh, these fountains when you are looking again from space. And by the, this time, you may be thinking that, OK, this is a magnificent view, but is this something scientifically knowledgeable that we can get out of it? Well, so the question is, why do we care? The thing to remember here is that these are direct samples that are coming from deep below. And here you are sampling these, this material to find out what lies at depth. And since I'm talking about water, the obvious question of whether the conditions are hospitable enough for life to have originated and evolved. And then of course, why is this tiny guy so active? I mentioned about one possible uh, source of energy, the squishing by Saturn, but there are a lot of complexities that we still need to resolve. Over here, what we are doing is, our efforts are <coughs> focused on gathering observational inputs that feed into understanding the origin of these geysers. What we do is simply look at light. I am able to see you because light is bouncing off your face and coming to me. So in case of these guys, we are using information from visual and infrared mapping spectrometer on the Cassini mission, which looks at a bunch of wavelengths. Some of them we cannot see. 
and schematically sunlight falling onto this uh, on these fountains is received by WIMS and is converted into a set of wavelengths just like rainbow. The previous talk also talked about that. So this light is split into a number of wavelengths. When we look at the contrast between the intensity at different wavelengths, I guess it's not coming here. Uh, so what we see is a variation in, in int intensity and we call it as a spectrum. This information is used to decipher a bunch of information that helps us understand the origin of these uh, features. So geysers in the near infrared wavelengths. So far I have shown you this image where what we are doing is we are gathering a bunch of information, all the light and packing into an image. But how about dividing this signal into 352 different channels? You see the same image, but degraded because you have degraded the signal by 352 times. But at the same time, you can still see these fractures over here corresponding to different uh, geysers. What can this uh, tell us about these geysers, this information, when we are splitting it into number of wavelength bands? Well, quite a number of things. To start with composition, particle sizes, particle velocities, and over here what we are doing is to understand and characterize the individual jets, which has been the first such attempt so far. So here is what we start with. We start with a bunch of spectra. This was what I was trying to show in the slide, doing like this, that we obtain a spectrum. And over here, we look at different wavelengths for different properties. So let's block one of the part and look here, which we call as an absorption band. And over here, I'm having a simplified profile of these bands where you see the band shape and some asymmetry. With this information, you can tell and this is the key information which helps us decipher that it's water ice. And one of the fractures along, one of the uh, fountains along which, one of the fractures along which the fountains are coming up have possible abundance of three to five micron particles. Not only that, you can even decipher from this tiny dip what was the temperature at which it was forming. So there is a lot of information that is available in these swig designs. Moving on, we look at a different area, and here we are looking at differences in slope, which tells us about the particle size distribution. And since the slope are varying, we can say that there is a difference in the particle size distribution of these fountains across different fractures. So you may be wondering, how does this information get together? There's a lot of information that different instruments are gathering. We are gathering certain set of information and then other set of information on board uh, Cassini is gathered and all together we are trying to generate a model. So far we have uh, used Cassini data and there is a lot of uh, excitement about new missions as well as new bodies like Europa which is a satellite of Jupiter and Cirrus, which is a dwarf planet. Both these have evidence of blue material, and there is a lot of interest in understanding both Enceladus as well as the plumes at these bodies. And all this data is publicly available. I would like to invite all of you to participate in this endeavor because everything is available in public, and together we can share the excitement. Thank you.